testified earlier before a House subcommittee on his agency's handling of Toyota car recalls. The subcommittee also heard from auto industry and safety association officials during this two-hour, 20-minute hearing. Now come to order. Uh, let me just <clears throat> say something in regards to uh, those of you who have been waiting since 10 a.m. this morning. I sincerely apologize. But as you know, the duties of the House are varied, and we did have to uh, postpone this meeting and with a series of votes and other matters. So uh, again, please accept my sincere apology for the delay. We are very cognizant of your time, and we value your time. So please accept our humble apology. And we will now proceed with this hearing. Uh, this hearing today is uh, a hearing of the Subcommittee on Commerce, Trade, and Consumer Protection. And the subject matter is NHTSA, <clears throat> the road ahead. And the chair recognizes himself for five minutes for the purposes of a, an opening statement. The Subcommittee on Commerce, Trade, and Consumer Protection is, is again, welcomes all the participants here uh, at this meeting. Our main purpose for coming together today is to assess NHTSA's functionality and its effectiveness. <clears throat> Last month, I promised America's motorists, passengers, and pedestrians that as this subcommittee takes up its jurisdictional responsibility to reauthorize NHTSA, we will help NHTSA regain the public confidence. <clears throat> this is our first occasion to welcome NHTSA's newest administrator, uh, Mr. David Strickland, uh, to this hearing and to uh, this committee, subcommittee and to this committee. Although Administrator Strickland's first several months at NHTSA's helm have been rocky and filled with difficult challenges, I know him to be a highly intelligent, thoughtful, capable, and caring professional. I expect that he will shoot straight with us as we begin crafting reauthorization of legislation that the members of this subcommittee can quickly support and move through uh, this subcommittee and through the full committee and take it to the floor of the House. I look forward to listening to both witnessing, uh, witness panels and hearing their views on what NHTSA is currently doing through its crash data analysis, its research, and its rulemaking to promote vehicular safety. Although I am typically not very stringent about enforcing time restrictions on member statements and questioning, uh, this is a different day. We are starting late, and uh, because of uh, the timeliness, I will not hesitate to drop the gavel of the day to keep us on point and, I might say, on uh, the right path as much as possible. The right roadway would be more appropriate. We have a lot of ground to cover, and we expect a number of members to participate. And I will ask my colleagues uh, to operate with a full understanding and to be as cooperative as possible as it relates to uh, the time consideration. And before I yield my time, I would like to say a few words about the scope of today's hearing. And let me be clear, this is not a hearing about Toyota's recall or its practices. Please try to restrain yourself from veering too far away from our purpose of examining NHTSA and NHTSA's configuration, NHTSA's organization, and NHTSA's 
performance in the areas of NEFAC's investigation, safety standards, and enforcement. Again, I want to thank all of our witnesses who have taken time out of your very important schedules in order to advise this subcommittee. Again, I want to say we're very more than thankful to you for your patience. Let us work collaboratively and constructively to ensure that NHTSA has on hand the necessary resources and capacity to fulfill its stated mission of saving lives, preventing injuries, and reducing economic costs due to road traffic crashes through education, research, safety standards, and enforcement activity. We are, you are all great Americans, and you become even greater Americans if you help us improve NHTSA. Thank you again. I yield back the balance of my time. And now I recognize the ranking member for five minutes, uh, my friend from Kentucky, Mr. Whitfield. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also want to thank you all for your patience, and we welcome the witnesses on both panels. I would like to start out, first of all, this afternoon by simply uh, congratulating the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. I noticed that today vehicles are safer than ever. In 2009, there were 33,963 highway fatalities, which is too many, but the fewest since 1954. Uh, the rate of fatalities in 2009 was 1.16 deaths per 100 million vehicle miles. And when the, th this record was first uh, recorded back in 1979, there were 3.34 fatalities per 100 million vehicle miles. Uh, I think that should make the public feel more comfortable, even though one death is one death too many. As a result of all the focus on Toyota, some commentators have opined that the system is broken and needs to be fixed. Those opinions are wide-ranging and point to many different issues, ranging from NHTSA's authority to the way in which it has utilized its authority. Mr. Sean Kane, who's president of the Safety Research and Strategies Company, which does a lot of consulting work for plaintiff trial lawyers, testified during the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee hearing last month uh, when he was asked the question, does NHTSA need more tools, more authority? He, he simply said that I think a number of errors were made in the process of these investigations, not so much that the tools were not available as much as the tools were not employed. So I think it's important that we uh, consider all of those things as we move forward. As far as uh, unintended uh, acceleration, this is a problem that has cut across three decades and multiple administrations without successful resolution. Similar to NHTSA's finding in the late 1980s and early 1990s, when it commissioned an independent examination of unintended acceleration, or the more recent review conducted between 1999 and 2000, the current investigation has not answered all questions and may never do so to everyone's uh, satisfaction. Regarding NHTSA's action, it is also not clear what more they could have done than what they've already done and whether the outcome would be any different. Administrator Strickland testified last week that there simply wasn't a strong enough case to force the issue of a mandatory recall, even if that had been NHTSA's decision. And if a problem cannot be clearly identified, a proposed fix most likely will not have a meaningful benefit. Um, I might also say that to date the Office of Inspector General within the Department of Transportation announced the initiation of an audit of NHTSA's Office of Defects Investigation to include an examination of its handling of Toyota as well as the broader issue of the pro process that ODI employs to examine and investigate safety defects. 
The Office of Inspector General's objectives are similar to those of this hearing, and that is simply to determine whether NHTSA has the tools and information available to investigate safety defects and identify possible improvements to its current procedures. And I think that's what this hearing is all about as we move forward with NHTSA. And I will yield back the balance of my time. The chair recognizes the vice chair of the subcommittee, uh, Ms. Schakowsky of Illinois, for five minutes for the purposes of, of opening statements. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm so happy that we're having this, uh, this hearing today. Uh, without a doubt, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration's profile has been um, has risen dramatically um, as a result of its role in responding to the dangerous problems with Toyota vehicles, probably uh, a little higher profile than perhaps you had wanted or anticipated. Um, this, uh, this hearing will give us the opportunity to explore whether NHTSA has the resources, expertise, and authority necessary to sufficiently investigate reports of safety problems and enforce existing safety rules. Um, I, I want to welcome um, Mr. Strickland to, uh, and congratulate him on his uh, new position and welcome him to this uh, committee. I know that you really are an advocate for consumers and it was uh, really a pleasure to be able to work with you um, earlier uh, on the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act when we worked together and you were in the, uh, in the Senate. So I, I, I know the, of your commitment to, uh, to consumers and, con and consumer safety. Um, my guess is, though, that right now we may find, we'll, we will find some gaps that need to be filled and I look forward to working with Chairman Rush and the subcommittee and with NHTSA in crafting legislation to address those gaps. Um, Mr. Strickland, in addition to discussing issues surrounding NHTSA's oversight and enforcement activities, I am looking forward to begin a dialogue with you about children's safety in and around cars and other proactive safety measures. I appreciate that we had a moment before this uh, 10 o'clock hearing <laughs> to uh, uh, discuss this uh, a, a bit. Um, in past years, Congress has enacted legislation requiring NHTSA to issue specific safety regulations. Dear to my heart uh, has been the Cameron Gobranson Kids Transportation Safety Act signed into law in 2008 requiring rulemaking on a rear visibility standard and a power window, window standard. And uh, I know that you're working on both of these issues as we speak, and it's my hope that both standards will be very strong in order to protect children. I have to tell you that I think the hardest thing that I have done in this Congress in my 12th, I mean my 12th year now, is having parents come with pictures of their children who are no longer with us, sometimes because they themselves um, inadvertently, and I think in very, in, we know in very large part due to design problems actually were responsible for the, those children's death. It's just the most unbearable thing to think about that these were preventable. And, uh, and yet these parents have turned this tragedy into a crusade to make automobiles safer, um, not just in traffic, but not in traffic. Um, and, and so um, I am looking forward to working with you um, to create standards that actually do prevent those accidents from, from, hap from happening. My concern is that in the past that Congress was forced to take action because NHTSA was not initiating badly needed rulemaking on its own. And so I look forward to working with you to make sure that NHTSA has all the tools it needs and that it uses its tools to protect consumers. I look forward to that very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Braley, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to applaud you and the ranking member for holding this important hearing. Um, it's really an honor to have you here today, Mr. Strickland. We haven't met before. 
and you have an important responsibility that is too often kept on the back pages of most newspapers and magazines. And it's only when something dramatic like these Toyota recall hearings comes up that the public starts to understand the critical role that your agency plays. You look, as, look to me like you're a young man. So I don't know if you know where you were on December 2nd, 1994, but I know where I was. I was not sitting in that chair, even though I was supposed to be sitting in that chair. Because I was supposed to be testifying that day in a recall hearing on side saddle fuel tank explosions involving CK General Motors pickup trucks. And I did not get the opportunity to testify because a settlement was reached that day between your agency and the Secretary of Transportation and General Motors whereby $51 million was paid for a supposed consumer safety programs so that the recall hearing would not go forward where people like me would have an opportunity to talk about the impact on human lives of defects that do not get solved. And I was going to testify that day about a client of mine, a young woman in Iowa, who had the right side of her face burned off when the pickup truck she was riding in was involved in a collision, and the pickup rolled over on its side, and because of the placement of those fuel tanks outside the frame rails, the flames went up the side of that pickup truck and engulfed her face in flames. And her husband, who was driving the pickup truck, pulled her young son, who was seat seated between them, through the broken windshield and got him to safety. And when he went back to try to rescue his wife, he reached in to grab her and pulled out big chunks of her hair that had burned off in the fire. Mm. And he went back to his son and told him, Mommy is in heaven now. But miraculously, this brave young woman survived and went through months and years of grueling, painful skin grafts, hair transplants, and incredible disfigurement because of that defect. And when we gather for these hearings, we spend a lot of time talking in very arcane, technical language about sudden unanticipated acceleration and electronic control safety devices but we rarely talk about the human impact of the failure to act. And so when, when you think about the important responsibilities your agency has, it's important not just to think about where we are today and where you're going to take that agency going forward, it's important to look backwards at the legacy of this, the legacy of this agency and why there are some people who, f who feel it has not fulfilled its responsibility to keep the American public safe. So I look forward to the opportunity to have a meaningful, long-term conversation with you about the important responsibilities you have, and I look forward to hearing your testimony today as we work together to get to the bottom of this unexplained problem. And I yield back. The chair now recognizes the uh, Chairman Emeritus of the full committee, the Dean of the Congress, my friend from the state of Michigan, Mr. Dingle, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your kindness and courtesy. I commend you for this hearing, which is very important, and I also commend you for your fine leadership of this subcommittee, with which you have done a splendid job. I want to observe that NHTSA's response to the safety defects implicated in these recalls has been sluggish. Likewise, NHTSA's decisions to terminate several internal, internal analysis related to the defective Toyota vehicles since 2003, due to a purported lack of resources, leave one with the impression that the agency lacks the appropriate level of personnel and appropriations with which to fill its mandate. We want to find out if that's the case today, because if that be so, then the safety of the American public is, of course, at question. As was the case with its sister agency, the Consumer Product Safety Commissions, NHTSA has suffered years of stagnation in funding, and in many cases has, has endured a reduction 
in personnel levels, most notably in its important office of defects investigation, ODI. Nevertheless, the agency possesses a number of powerful enforcement tools, many of which uh, were augmented under the Transportation Recall Enhancement Accountability and Documentation, or the TREAD Act of 2000. In addition to being able to compel manufacturers to recall defective vehicles, NHTSA may impose civil penalties for noncompliance and criminal penalties for falsification or withholding of information. This in mind, we must ask ourselves today why these authorities were not used in the case of recent Toyota recalls. Put another way, are the problems with NHTSA's response to the recalls better traced to a lack of authority or rather to ineptitude and lack of resources? At present, it appears that the latter is more persuasive, although I will not discount the possibility that improvement can be made in the statutes of conferring NHTSA its authority. Our discussion of NHTSA's authorities and resources must not lose fact, rather must not lose sight of what I believe to be malfeasance on the part of Toyota in properly addressing the problems that led to the recall of over 8 million vehicles to reauthorize NHTSA without a view towards compelling better behavior by automobile manufacturers would be a self-defeating exercise. Two weeks ago, my questioning of Mr. James Lentz, Toyota head of sales for North America, indicated that all of Toyota's decisions relating to recalls are made in Tokyo. More disquieting is the fact that U.S. officials, the Secretary of Transportation, and the then head of NHTSA had to fly to Japan to persuade Toyota to initiate recalls in the United States. In brief, we must examine how best to oblige automobile manufacturers selling vehicles in the United States to comply quickly and fully with our regulations and law. In closing, I suggest my colleagues bear these comments in mind as we begin what must be the first of many conversations about improving federal oversight of transportation safety. I further ask that these discussions and their resultant legislation will be bipartisan, collegial, and subject to the regular order, for these are the hallmarks of this committee's best work over the years. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your kindness. I thank our witnesses for appearing before us and yield back the 58 seconds remaining to me. <laughs> the chair thanks the gentleman for his extraordinary kindness. We, uh, it's the normal practice of this committee uh, to swear in the witnesses. So would you stand and raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Let the record reflect that the witness has. Uh, Responding in the affirmative. Uh, the chair recognizes himself now for uh, five minutes for questioning the witness. Oh, I'm sorry. After uh, <laughs> the chair's getting uh, ahead of himself. <laughs> it's been a long day. Uh, the chair want to recognize now the administrator because uh, he has. Uh, Certainly some opening statements, so the Chair recognizes the Administrator for five minutes for the purposes of opening statements. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. To be perfectly honest with you, my statement is not as important as the uh, Committee's questions, so I can understand you wanting to hurry up and get to business. Um, first great beginning, all, excuse me, great beginning. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much for your kind words, all of you. Um, and before I begin my formal remarks, I want to just take a second uh, to acknowledge Mr. Braley and Ms. Schakowsky's note about the human toll. Um, we have a tremendous amount of death on today's highways, and I'm very happy to report some very good news, but 33,000 people is a tremendous amount of people to die, and one person is too many. And the personal toll that it takes on a family um, is 
absolutely um, catastrophic. And in my time that I served as a staffer on the Senate Commerce Committee, I've had the opportunity to spend time with uh, countless victims, including um, mothers and fathers who have uh, killed their children in unfortunate back over accidents, and folks that have been disfigured and burned because of traffic accidents, because of defects, and, and you can never properly capture what this means to people. So I am fully aware of the responsibility that I have and that every day this agency has one goal. That's to keep people alive and safe on the road. And we can never do that job well enough. We just simply can't. But that doesn't mean that we can't try. And we will continue to put forth maximum effort as we have to make sure that we accomplish the goals. But thank you so much for your observations and, uh, and they are taken well to heart. Chairman Rush, Ranking Member Whitfield, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the Department of Transportation's vision for the future of the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and its, safe, and its important safety programs. Transportation safety is the department's highest priority. NHTSA's safety programs are an integral part of addressing that priority. Even before I was sworn in as administrator on January 4th, I knew NHTSA's programs work, and they work well. We just released numbers that show a continuing dramatic reduction in the overall number of highway deaths. The Secretary this morning released a report that projects that traffic fatalities have declined for the 15th consecutive quarter and will be 33,963 in 2009, the lowest annual level since 1954. But we must do more. The loss of more than 33,000 people represents a serious public health problem to our nation. We will not rest until that number is zero. So how do we get there? Highway safety is a complex problem, and NHTSA has built a broad spectrum of programs that address both behavioral and vehicle-related causes of highway deaths. The linchpin of all of our programs is good data, good science, and careful engineering. When I was sworn in two months ago, I felt it was important to look at whether there was a need to improve NHTSA's effectiveness in this era of the global marketplace and rapidly changing technologies. One of my first decisions was to question whether NHTSA is being well served by the four vehicle statutory authorities on which it relies to regulate. That rea the reality is, is that while current authority does work, and various constituencies have learned to work with them. They were written in the 1960s and the 1970s when the world and the automobile market were profoundly different. The question I pose and the questions I want to have is whether NHTSA's statutory authorities accommodate the modern automobile, the modern competitive marketplace even. More importantly, do they allow us to regulate in a way that allows the industry to build and sell safe products that the consumer wants to drive? Do they allow us to promote safety, innovation, and fuel efficiency while providing effective regulatory and, in and enforcement oversight? I've asked our legal and program staff to take, a look, to take a look at our existing authorities, to answer these questions, and to make their best recommendations. I believe this self-assessment is critical and supports the President's goals for transparency and accountability in government. And while we are taking a hard look at our authorities, I also commit to look at the current ethics rules. I believe the ethics standards set by this administration are the highest ever established by any administration. And I fully support Secretary LaHood's desire to tighten and enforce these rules across the Department of Transportation. If there is any evidence of any violations of these rules, swift and appropriate action will be taken. The next question I ask of NHTSA is, do we have the programmatic expertise that we need to support our programs? NHTSA has a diverse and experienced workforce, and we will take full advantage of their skills, talent, and expertise. If, as we go forward, we find that we need to shore up our workforce in certain areas, we will recruit aggressively. We are, request, we are currently requesting the authority to hire 66 more people next year and will target these positions to meet our program needs. 
Well, at this point, it appears I am out of time, so I will I'll cut my remarks here. And I thank the committee for their time and their patience, and I stand ready for questions. Chair, thanks, uh, uh, the administrator. <clears throat> and the chair recognizes himself for, for five minutes. Uh, <clears throat> as been stated, uh, Mr. Administrator, you know, our goal and the goal of this subcommittee as it relates to NHTSA is uh, to look forward and to determine for ourselves what is the best way that we can assure and, and, and assist NHTSA uh, in its primary goal of protecting America's citizens and America's drivers. As I look at this scenario uh, of this Toyota as an incident, as a framework, I wonder uh, about the safety, the quality of the safety of the automobiles on America's highways in general. Um, the question I have is, what reason can you give us this subcommittee that we can, should not think that the recent total recall that it would not replay itself with uh, any other automobile dealer that puts automobiles, manufactured automobiles for America's highways. Can you, what reason, can you assure us that this Toyota recall is really just uh, something that is an aberration uh, as it relates to automobile safety. I would say this, Mr. Chairman, that um, the Toyota recall, while wide-ranging, is, I think, indicative of how NHTSA uses its authority in a way to get to the bottom of something. Um, when uh, the Secretary of Transportation took office, and at the time it was Acting Administrator Medford, they were observing certain issues with Toyota, and they felt so strongly about it that Mr. Medford went to Japan to inform Toyota that they did not feel that Toyota was holding up its obligations to inform and to interact with NHTSA in a way to address safety concerns and recall concerns. That was the beginning. That effort began actually on December the 15th. It was the day of my confirmation hearing, which is a good reason why the entire senior staff um, regarding defects was actually in Japan and not at my hearing. But better that they be there in Japan explaining to Toyota what they were doing wrong than be sitting in a hearing room here in Washington, D.C. When I took office in January the 4th, I was updated about these issues, and Toyota was at that point beginning to get the message. I again met with them personally for the first time on January the 19th, um, informing, and I learned about the sticky pedal situation. And they actually executed their stop sale on January the 21st. That effort was because of the analysis of NHTSA, the fast action of the career staff, and the leadership of the Secretary of Transportation. So I don't see Toyota as an, as an indicative um, example of failure. I see it as NHTSA doing its job. And when our professionals use the data, make the case, and go forward, we get the results that we need. So I think that Toyota, in the wide-ranging recall that it executed, that's the type of response that, frankly, I would want as administrator, and I think that this agency is expecting. And I would hope that in the future that other automakers would do the same in the same set of facts. Can you give me any, uh, give us something, any, any assurances that the automobiles right now, as far as this is concerned, uh, has a level of safety that is, uh, that is 
a greater or greater than what we have uh, experienced with Toyota at this point. I, I have, there's two parts of that answer. Mm -hmm. First, I will go back to the success that we just had in regarding the current data. We have the lowest number of deaths since we've had, since we've been recording this data since 1954. NHTSA is succeeding in its mission. Um, the second part of your question, do I feel that vehicles are generally safe or, sa or will be safe and we won't have any other issue like Toyota? It is the automaker's responsibility to warrant that their vehicles comply with the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards. That is their responsibility. We are not um, branding these cars safe. It's our job to enforce and to, and to police the marketplace, which we will do. So as far as I'm concerned, the automakers have to uphold their obligation to not only comply with our standards, but basically the state of the art. It is my job to make sure that they hold to those standards, and this agency will hold that line. Uh, the chair's time is up. The chair recognizes Mr. Whitfield for five minutes. Well, Mr. Strickland, thank you again for joining us this afternoon. And uh, uh, as I said in my opening statement, I do think that the agency should be commended because the highways really are safer today than they've ever been from a statistical standpoint. Uh, you would agree with that, I'm assuming. Yes, sir. Now, we've heard a lot of, there have been a lot of articles written, a lot of testimony recently that uh, NHTSA has not fulfilled its responsibility. Uh, NHTSA is a lapdog for the industry, not a watchdog for the industry. And uh, so there's been a lot of criticism out there about the, uh, about the agency. And as the administrator, how would you uh, respond to that in just a general way? Do you think that criticism is valid or not valid? No, sir, it's not valid at all. We have been a very active agency since I've taken office. The agency has been very active since Secretary LaHood has taken office. And from my review of the work done on, if we're talking about Toyota specifically, this agency opened eight separate investigations over the time period when there were complaints about sudden acceleration. Um, a lapdog doesn't open eight investigations. Now, the goal is for us, and our statutory you know, order is to find any vehicle safety defect that presents an unreasonable risk. Any time a complaint or any data or any anomaly in the number of complaints or what we see from the early warning system, our folks take a look at it, they go forward and they investigate. If we cannot find the defect, we cannot under the statute go forward and force a mandatory recall. But that doesn't mean that we think that vehicle is safe per se. At that point, we cannot make the statutory case, but we will keep looking. And as we have, we keep looking, and when we find a defect, such as in the instance of the floor mat entrapment, or the instance of the sticky pedal, or in the instance of the 2010 Prius brakes, we act and we act quickly. I don't think that the history of our action in this area before I took office or the 10-year period that a lot of people are looking at, I think that this agency has been quite active. Okay, now, uh, if you find a defect, then you can require a mandatory recall. Is that correct? Yes, sir, we can. Okay. And I've heard a lot of discussion about subpoena power, and it's my understanding that you all have inform issue that you can issue information requests. Yes, sir. And do the manufacturers have to respond to that request? Is it? Yeah, um, there's, a, there's a difference between a subpoena and an information request. I know a lot of people talk about we have subpoena power. And yes, we can compel a subpoena for documents. We say we want to give every document you have on a question. And yes, they have to give that to us. Information requests, they also have to respond, but it has actually a better purpose. We not only get documents, we actually ask direct questions that they give us answers to. It's a much sharper tool, and the agency uses that quite frequently. In fact, we sent three queries to Toyota, three large queries, regarding the timeliness of their submission of information to us regarding the floor mats and the, and the sticky pedal. And we sent a large recall query asking Toyota for all their information and to answer questions about all of sudden acceleration incidents, which will be a large amount of documents and data for us to review. If we find in the review of those documents that there is a violation, we will move forward accordingly. Uh, have you found the lack of subpoena power a hindrance to the agency doing its job effectively? 
in my review of the work on Toyota, they have been able to, while Toyota has been slow in years past, I will, I will say that they have not been as responsive as my career staff feel they should have been in responses. Since I have been in office, they have been very responsive, and I would hope that that would continue in the future. But in terms of the ability, our subpoena power, our ability to get information requests issued and responded to, I've gotten no evidence that that has been a problem in terms of getting a response. Now, I know most of your budget money goes to the states for grants, and then the rest is spent basically between behavioral science or behavioral safety and vehicle safety, is that correct? That is correct, sir. And uh, I know that two, in 2005, Congress uh, directed NHTSA to conduct a national motor vehicle crash causation survey. Mm -hmm. And at that time, it came back and it said that 95% of crashes uh, were due primarily to driver fault or negligence. Uh, are you familiar with that study, or do you have any thoughts on that? I, I am. I am I am tangentially familiar with it. I can't give you song, chapter, and verse about the study, but I can talk in sort of in more specifics about behavior. That is the largest component of risk on the highway, which is the reason why the NHTSA budget is designed to attack the highest risk. Mm -hmm. Impaired driving, not wearing belts, driving distracted, those are all the hugest risks for everyone on the road today. Vehicle defects are important. We have to address them. They are significant. But in terms of the overall risk profile for highway safety, the behavioral side of the, of the, of the, of the house, so to speak, comprises the largest risk. And that's the reason why our program for safety is designed the way it is. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Whitman. The, the Chairman Emeritus is recognized for five minutes. Um, my questions in view of the time shortage are going to have to require yes or no answers. Yes, Mr. Dingell. Um, Mr. Administrator, uh, do you believe that the NHTSA made mistakes in its response to the recent Toyota recalls? No, sir, I do not. Um, should NHTSA have pushed Toyota to initiate recalls earlier than it did? We pushed, re sir, they, we pushed the recalls when we had the evidence of an unreasonable risk defect, so. All right. Uh, but yes or no? Um, the answer is yes, we have responded appropriately. Okay. Thank you. Now, what authorities does NHTSA lack, whether under TREAD Act or otherwise, with which to address defects in automobiles deemed hazardous to public safety? Please submit that answer for the record. Yes, sir. Now, yes or no, does NHTSA have, a place, uh, have in place a ranking system for determining the priority of defects investigations, yes or no? The answer is no, but we rank risks by profile internally. There right. isn't a one through 10. Thank you. Um, now, there seems to be broad agreement about the need to increase resources available to NHTSA to carry out its, its mission. Do you need additional resources, yes or no? The President's budget gives us more resources, so Do if the President's budget more? is passed, we will have the resources we need. All right. Uh, please. Please submit to us for the record how much more resources you need in what area. Yes, sir. I want that submitted directly to the committee and not through OMB. Yes, sir. Now, uh, in my questioning of James Lentz, Toyota's chief of sales for North America, uh, he revealed that decisions to recall Toyota vehicles sold in North America uh, are made in Japan. Um, do any other manufacturers require that uh, your information for details or that decisions uh, made relative to recalls are uh, made in, in any country outside this United States? Is Toyota unique in that, yes or no? It appears Toyota is unique, yes, sir. All right. Um, it's, it strikes me that this is a bad situation insofar as safety of the American people. Am I correct or wrong? The system that Toyota uses could be much more efficient. Okay. By requiring them to have a response to be made in the United States by somebody empowered to comply with our laws. Is that right? I would feel that if they had somebody in America to respond directly, we could, ha we could act more quickly All with right. them. Yes, sir. Now, uh, I would, like, would appreciate if you would submit to us for the record how this would be corrected. Now. Is there a quantitative difference in response times between 
domestic and foreign automobile manufacturers to NHTSA's data inquiries? Yes or no? The domestic manufacturers tend to respond faster than the foreign. Yes, sir. Um, what is the cause for this? There are several reasons in terms of design of leadership, as, we, as you mentioned, and other factors. Um, in the case of Toyota, it's because the uh, information has to be procured from Toyota instead of receiving it directly from here. Is that, that right? Is, that has been identified by Toyota itself as a problem. This is also true with regard to the question of recall. Yes, sir. The decision is made in Tokyo. That is correct. Now, um, is there a qualitative or quantitative difference in the data provided to NHTSA by domestic and foreign automobile manufacturers? The quality is, because they're statutorily required, the quality is, of data is very similar between foreign and domestic. Similar? Similar. That doesn't mean it's the same. They have, different, they have different data sets because of their manufacturing and information processes. They comply to our system, so they are similar. All right. Now, why was it that the Secretary of Transportation and the Secretary, or rather, and the acting head of NHTSA had to go to Tokyo to get cooperation of Toyota on recalls and production of information? They were responding to NHTSA and the acting administrator and the secretary too slowly. But they had to go over there. Why did they have to go over there? Because at the time, the secretary and the acting administrator felt they needed to go directly to convey that message. Uh, so they had to convey that message because the message was to urge Toyota to comply more expeditiously with the, with the safety concerns of that is correct, Department sir. of Transportation. I'm sorry? That is correct. Okay, so they had to do it to, more, to get more expeditious cooperation from Toyota. Yes, sir. That's correct. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your courtesy. Uh, the chair now recognizes Ms. Schakowsky for five minutes for questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in, on September 1, 2009, proposed rules were put out dealing with the automatic reverse system on windows. Um, let me quote, NHTSA proposes requiring automatic reversal systems, ARS, in those windows equipped with one-touch closing, closing or express up operation, operation. In a letter, March 10, 2010, that uh, is sent to you, Mr. Strickland, um, it was uh, Henry Waxman, Chairman Rush, and uh, myself point out that such windows generally already have auto reverse technology and are usually found in the driver's window where children don't sit. And the intention of the legislation, of course, was to protect children. But here's really the point I want to make that I find stunning is that you have a chart. This was alternative one of five alternatives that were proposed at that, at that time. This is before your, your tenure. Alternative one is the one I described. And when it says uh, on, this, uh, on this chart, cost per window for this remedy, supposedly, it says zero dollars, total incremental cost, near zero dollars, annual fatality benefits, zero, annual injury benefits, near zero. So the preferred alternative to protect children was a no cost, no benefit solution. I would have thought it embarrassing, actually not only to put that in writing, but to choose that as the preferred option. I would hope that nothing like that happens again. Let me describe alternative two, requiring um, auto reverse uh, windows at all power side windows to meet um, ECE 21, which is European standards. The cost per window six dollars, which I think most people would find reasonable. 
um, the total incremental cost, $149.4 million, annual fatality benefits too, annual injury benefits, 850. So two deaths and 850 injuries, which I think is a pretty modest projection, pretty conservative, um, could be saved. That was at six bucks a, a window. Um, again, I want to go back to those families that came talking about children who were choked by these windows. It's got to be maddening to them that this is something that could have been corrected for six dollars and that that is the European Union standard. Why isn't it the standard here? So really, my, my, quest, my request is that we reject this alternative one, but how, how does that happen? Can we expect that it will not happen anymore, that a no-cost, no-benefit solution will not be proposed? Um, as you know, Representative Schakowsky, I can't in, um, engage in a discussion about a rule that is currently being worked on by NHTSA. Um, but I understand that we have received um, new data from a lot of constituencies, including the folks that have worked very closely with you and other members on the Cameron Gold Branson Act. And the agency is taking a very hard look at that data. And when the rule um, is finally promulgated, um, I, we hope that we will be, I, I know for a fact it will be based on sound data and sound size that will be the most efficacious of safety. Um, so that's okay. the one thing I can tell you. Well, let me make a very strong recommendation that you don't, that you don't propose rules that have absolutely no effect when the Congress stated very clearly that we want to protect children. And I, I'm sure you'll agree with that, so I thank you very much. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Brady, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Strickland, in your opening statement that we received, the written statement, on page one, uh, third paragraph, you wrote, one of the first questions I asked when I became the administrator of NHTSA is whether our current statutory authority, drafted largely in the 1960s and 1970s, is sufficient to address the modern automobile and global automotive marketplace. Yes, sir. Have you answered that question? That question is still being worked on by the staff. Um, I have uh, a great deal of experience at looking at uh, consumer product safety statutes um, from my uh, prior employee, and you have to be very careful in examining these things in that we have to make sure that there is a lot in those statutes that are very functional and works well. And we want to look to improve upon a strong authority. And my staff, both my legal staff and my programmatic staff are undertaking that work right now. When we've completed that work, we will be happy and excited to share um, our thoughts with the committee and looking forward to working with you on a going forward basis. And I look forward to having that conversation. And let me get back to one of my earlier points about the legacy of the agency that you now head. Yes, sir. Because in your statement, you noted correctly that safety is the Department of Transportation's highest priority. And you yes. stand by that statement today. Yes, sir, absolutely. And we know that the Office of Defect Investigation, often referred to by its acronym ODI, is on the front line of defect investigation and prevention as part of the Department of Transportation. Yes, sir, that is correct. And Mr. Whitfield asked you a very appropriate question when he said, you have mandatory recall power, and you answered yes. Do you remember that? Yes, sir. Can you explain to all of us then why your agency, NHTSA, has not initiated a recall since 1979. Because you can often influence a recall by going through the initial stages of the process. Most times, an automaker will not want to go through the full form of process. It, it, it takes approximately a year. It's a public process, and a lot of automakers realizing they are facing um, public scrutiny of fighting a vehicle safety defect, and when they know that the agency can prove it, they will go forward and effectuate a voluntary recall. The universe is, is that 
most recalls are voluntary. All recall recalls since that period of time are voluntary. But there is a huge number that are influenced by this agency, and that's the actual number that one should look at. And we influence well over, uh, well over half of the recalls that are happen every year. So that's the real number, Mr. Braley, I think that is indicative of the power of ODI. We don't have to get to a point where the administrator, after a year of public hearings and, and, and show cause hearings, has to sign an order. Automakers will go forward and take care of that recall voluntarily from ODI's work. Well, count me as skeptical that in a 31-year period, there has not been an instance where automakers acted responsibly in every particular case responding to demand for recall of a product defect in a 31-year period. Um, one of the things that I also want to talk to you about is um, how you, you described the agency's mission has changed in response to changes in the automotive industry. Do you remember that in your real opening remarks? I don't think I would call it a change in mission, but it's a change in how we have to approach the job because of the change in the marketplace. Um, there was a time when America was the world's leader in ma automotive manufacture. We are no longer that leader. Well, I'm talking about something different, so I want to make sure you understand. I apologize. Okay. Really. When I was growing up, it was during the muscle car era yes, sir. where you could tear apart a Chevy large block engine in your basement and put it back mm -hmm. together having a basic knowledge of the internal combustion engine. Yes, you cannot do that anymore. Would you concede that? I agree. Yes, sir. And one of the things that came out during our earlier hearing was this concept of black box technology mm -hmm. that has crash data in it mm -hmm. that is driven by complex computer code, sometimes which the manufacturer is willing to share with your agency, and sometimes manufacturers have been re very reluctant to share that data or to provide an ability for your own employees to have the keys to the kingdom so that they can download and interpret that information independently. You would agree with that? Yes, sir, I agree. So one of the things that I'm concerned about is our own internal committee report for this hearing suggests that your agency's budget dedicated to vehicle safety has remained stagnant relatively over the past 10 years and that your resources are far below the resources that were available for this type of investigation than when the agency was at its height. And, and my concern is, based upon some of the testimony at the previous hearing, when you have a demand for computer engineers and electrical engineers and people who were not based on mechanical backgrounds, I'm concerned that the level of funding and the staffing of personnel within your agency may not be adequate to meet the incredible demands of the changing technology of this automobile industry. Have you done an independent review since assuming responsibility to make your own independent judgment on whether or not that is a critical case we need to address. I have a couple of responses to that, Mr. Braley. Um, the work of ODI and the automotive engineers that work, that do the work, they are some of the finest in the business in this country. And as the technology evolves, the experience of our investigators and our engineers also evolve. Um, I can give you the quantum number of folks that we have on deck to do the job. We have 125 engineers of all of NHTSA. We have five electrical engineers. We have a software engineer. We have engineers that are based in our East Liberty, Ohio facility. We have resources for consultants when we need additional um, you know, expertise. I, and from my understanding, from what I know from when I've taken office, there is not a notion that we are, don't have the proper, you know, uh, expertise to handle today's automobile. I don't think that's the case at all. However, recognizing that you can always buttress what you have. The President has provided us resources to hire 66 new people, which we will use to leverage our resources and, and to buttress and strengthen those folks. In addition to, we will be looking at ways that how we can do longitudinal studies and long-range studies on these complex systems as the Secretary spoke about in the prior hearings. Um, is my confidence that we can we handle the current marketplace with our expertise? Yes, we can. Can we be stronger in that? area? Of course we can.
of the 62 employees you've identified that are in the President's budget request, how many of those do you propose to allocate to ODI? That's part of that. That's undergoing process. I'm working with the career staff and with the Office of the Secretary to figure out what our resource needs would be in that area. I will be happy to uh, come forward with that information when the decision is made. Can you also provide the committee with a breakdown of the people working at ODI with engineering degrees by their names, their job titles, and what their particular expertise in terms of being a professional engineer is. Be happy to do that, Mr. Braley. Thank you. That, uh, I appreciate that, and I yield back. The chair recognizes now the gentlelady from Michigan, Ms. Sutton, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ohio, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. close to Michigan, but I'm from Ohio. Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> um, Again. That's okay. Uh, Administrator Strickland, thank you for being here. I have a, a number of questions and they touch on different areas, so bear with me as we shift around. Um, beginning with the question of the black box technology, we've heard a lot about um, when Secretary LaHood was here, he indicated um, a difficulty getting the information that, uh, that is in those black boxes, that we don't have the capacity, whether it is, uh, as my colleague, Mr. Braley, uh, describes that we don't have keys to the to the kingdom, which is is that information. But when I heard you answer Representative Dingle about having access to data, you said we have access to data in a similar way, whether it's Toyota who keeps mm -hmm. information in Japan and our domestic auto industry. But I was under the impression, based on the last hearing, that we actually could access uh, information from our domestic auto ma uh, manufacturers in a, uh, in a way that we can't get from Toyota. So could you clarify for me? Happy to clarify. I uh, took from Mr. Dingle's question about early warning reporting data, which is a quarterly data we receive from all automakers, which is a set template of data that we receive. There are some differences in how they collate and present it, but we can understand all of that. That's what I thought he meant. Okay. In terms of uh, event data recorders, you're absolutely right, Representative Sutton. Um, Toyota has a proprietary system that um, up until, I guess, a week or so ago, there was only one tool in the country that could be used to read it, and we did not have that tool. So if we ever wanted to get information from an event data recorder on a Toyota vehicle, it was very difficult. It is my understanding that Toyota has provided my ODI staff three of these tools to read um, their event data recorders. I am not sure the status of whether we have received them all yet, but that's my understanding that Toyota has made that, has promised to us that they would provide those tools. So in terms of Mr. Dingle's question, in terms of the set data that comes into us quarterly from all automakers, yes, it's similar. On your question on event data recorders, yes, there is a difference between the Detroit automakers, which all use a commercially available tool and we have the ability to read it, versus Toyota, where we could not up until a week ago. Okay. And now that you have this equipment, you will, that was the only hindrance to having access to the black boxes. You can, you can get them. You can always get access. We can access it, Representative, but there's still, we still need a Toyota representative to help decode the data. It isn't fully transparent even when we download the box. So I still believe that we do need have Toyota representation to assist us in decoding what happened five seconds pre-crash and one second post crash, I believe, is the data that's being included on those boxes. And is that something that they're uh, required in any way to do, or is that just a voluntary uh, Everything is offer on their at part? At this point, at this point, we are undergoing undergoing a rule by 2012. It is if an automaker chooses to have an EDR on board, it has to comport with certain readability and data standards. But they don't have to have an electronic um, event, right, an electronic data recorder on board. It is not mandated. Well, that's interesting. We'll have to we'll have to follow that and see um, what the the consequences intended and others uh, are of, of that that rulemaking. And um, okay, uh, with respect to um, what we've been reading, we've been reading in the Washington Post uh, uh, about the relationship between some of those who used to work at NHTSA and going over to work for some of the car companies. And in this, you know, in this moment, Toyota is in the headlines. Um, and so the Post article mentioned that two former NHTSA 
defects investigators left the agency and immediately took jobs at Toyota managing federal defect investigations. Mm -hmm. And do you think that there is a, uh, a, a, an apparent conflict of interest here? You know, we're charged with, as members of Congress, ensuring that, that, uh, that, that the public interest is always the key. And you can understand that people are a little uh, more than a little concerned when they see sort of that, that, that cozy, quick turnover of revolving door. Could you comment on that? Uh, certainly. Um, I have two responses to that, Representative. Um, no ethics laws were broken. You know, Mr. Santucci and, um, and Mr. Tento, who are former employees of NHTSA, when they left their post-employment, they were of the level of employee. They, everything that they did was fully compliant with the current federal laws regarding post-employment limitations. So no laws are broken. But I'm not going to quibble with you on appearance. Perception is reality. And as, and the Secretary was very clear in his statement to this committee and to um, Oversight and Government Reform and to the Senate Commerce Committee on this issue. Um, he is committed to strengthening um, the ethics requirements in the Department of Transportation. I fully support his efforts. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to hold every employee in NHTSA to the highest ethical standard as the Secretary holds everybody in DOT to the highest standard. And frankly, the Obama administration has made it a focal point that this will be the most ethical administration in history. So as far as we are looking forward to working with you on a going forward basis and dealing and handling this issue of appearance and um, arm's length distance between um, um, for employees of NHTSA and when they move into a post-employment situation. I appreciate that answer because the public trust is critically important and, and, and making sure that uh, things are working as they should. And if I could just, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could just indulge in one last question. During the hearings that we've had in the past with um, representatives of Toyota and, um, and Secretary LaHood, we heard information about how recalls of vehicles had happened in other countries who were, and, and these recalls, um, you know, uh, stemming from what appear to be problems that arose here in this country and led to eventual recalls after much tragedy uh, had occurred. Is there anything that, that requires um, auto manufacturers to report to NHTSA uh, problems beyond our borders with vehicles that are sold in this country? Yeah, there's a couple of requirements, actually. Uh, they, have to, they have to report to us foreign recalls that involve components used in the United States vehicles, and they have to also report um, foreign service campaigns um, and that happens in vehicles. Now, the question is whether they did this timely. We definitely will investigate those issues. But there is, we receive a lot of data from the early warning system and other obligations from the TREAD Act. And we're definitely looking at other ways that other types of information that could be helpful to us in that mission. And we're looking forward to working with the Congress and, and finding ways that we can buttress um, those abilities. Uh, the chair uh, requests, uh, we see Mr. Mark has joined the subcommittee. He's not a member of the committee, so the chair seeks unanimous consent that Mr. Mark be allowed to ask questions of the witness and hear him no objection. Uh, so ordered. And Mr. Mark, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your hospitality. <coughs> uh, as you know, uh, the early warning system that I helped to create during the 2000 TREAD Act was intended to provide the Department of Transportation and the public with early information that auto manufacturers receive about safety-related complaints. But the Bush administration issued a regulation that deemed almost all of the information automakers submit to be confidential business information. As a result, as far as the public is concerned about my provision back in 2000, the early warning system has become an early warning secret. I have a summary here of the public information uh, contained in all of the early warnings submitted by Toyota in the last quarter of 2008. It tells you that there were seven reports of deaths or serious injuries due to speed control, but that is all the information you get. The public can't learn whether those reports relate to sudden unintended acceleration. They can't learn what happened. 
Uh, and they can't learn whether any consumers made complaints about similar problems that didn't result in a serious injury or death. Do you agree that the public versions of early warning system data don't really tell the public anything specific or useful about potential automobile safety problems? Mr. Markey, the one thing I'd like to start off with saying is that the NHTSA databases and the information we provide are some of the most transparent in government. And we've been um, noted by the federal government about um, the, our data sources that we provide. In terms of the early warning system, um, as far as the Obama administration is concerned, as far as I'm concerned as an as administrator, the more transparency we have, the better. Um, I would definitely like to have a dialogue with you about the early warning reporting system and, and your thoughts on how we can improve transparency going forward. Now, consumers can report safety complaints to NHTSA as well, and these reports are made public. Does it make sense to you that when a consumer reports a safety problem directly to NHTSA, it goes into a publicly searchable database, but when a consumer, not knowing that they could complain to NHTSA, instead reports the safety problem to a car company, that it becomes confidential business information without a requirement that the public learn about it. Do you think that's right, or do you think that that information should as well have to be made public because it's given to NHTSA as part of a public report? I clearly see that inconsistency. Um, this administration believes in transparency, would happily talk to you on a going forward basis how we can make our databases more transparent. Do you think that information should be information that the public, my, me as an owner of a Toyota uh, Camry, should I have had that information? That information should not be hidden in my, in my personal opinion. However, there's other things that should come into play and I'm happy to talk to you on a going forward basis. When President Clinton signed the act into law, he directed the Department of Transportation to implement the early warning system in a manner that ensures maximum public availability of information. That clearly hasn't ha uh, happened. Uh, so my goal is to work with you, uh, sir, in order to accomplish that goal. Uh, we thank you for taking this job, by the way. Thank uh, you, Mr. Martin. And we enjoy we have enjoyed working with you over all the years, especially on the fuel economy standards and your work in the Senate. Thank you. Uh, and let me ask, if I may, one final question. Uh, although NHTSA can undertake a mandatory recall, doing so takes a great deal of time and can require you to go to court to prove the existence of a safety defect. There are times, however, when uh, taking that long costs lives. As you know, since uh, you were the lead staffer in the Senate <laughs> two years ago. Congress gave the Consumer Product Safety Commission the authority to quickly inform the public of an imminent product safety hazard, even though the formal recall process was complete. Do you think that sort of, sort of authority could help NHTSA more effectively protect and inform the public of serious safety problems? And will you work with us to develop such a provision? The eminent hazard authority, Mr. Markey, is and several of our sister consumer product safety, uh, consumer safety agencies. The Federal Rail Administration, for example, has this um, authority and it's proven to be very helpful to them. I look forward to working with you and having a further discussion on this authority. Um, it has proven very successful in other areas of consumer protection and it may brew, uh, bear food for NHTSA as well. Thank you. And our country is very fortunate that you were willing to accept this uh, position. Thank you, Mr. Marcus. Very kind. Thank you, sir. Uh, the chair will uh, ask uh, the indulgence of the uh, witness just for a few more minutes. Uh, the chair will, uh, uh, will uh, authorize a second uh, series of questions, and the chair recognizes himself for two minutes. So, uh, uh, NHTSA's budget uh, for vehicle safety programs has been stagnant, as was mentioned earlier, for the past 10 years. Um, uh, from my perspective, the, this year's budget request is down a few million dollars from the, from the year before. Uh, ODI, which focuses its enforcement activities on new cars, so within the last five years has a budget of less than $10 million uh, to police a fleet of 80 million vehicles. And that, uh, according to the Chicago Public Schools 
adds up to about 10 cents a car. Um, the budget for our rulemaking is suffering as well. It has delayed major rulemaking efforts to the point that Congress has been compelled to legislate mandates for rollover standards and for child safety. Uh, the agency is, is, as far as I can see, is initially starved. And it's, the impact of the starvation is pretty clear. Uh, I know that there's an increase of about 66 new personnel, uh, but if you get more resources for your safety programs, where would you focus those increased resources? Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, you know, the safety mission is not simply in the ODI or the vehicle safety um, office. It is actually across, it's our entire mission, it's the behavioral side as well. And the President's budget provides resources for us to accomplish our mission with the new resources for those personnel. Um, we will take a hard look at those 66 personnel and deploy them at the places where we need not only to improve and strengthen um, the Office of Defects Investigation, but in other places that where we can also help further our safety mission in the most efficient way. In terms of you know resources overall, um, we have accomplished our mission with the resources we have had. The President has, has given us a budget that gives us more resources to do more, and we will use that for the safety mission. All right. this, this Congress has to prepare a budget. The President yes, said a budget, the Congress has to approve a budget. And we certainly will be looking at need and not greed. Yes, sir. Uh, would you have any uh, objections if the if we gave you more than a budget for 66 employees? Mr. Rush, the President's budget helps us accomplish our mission. If the decision of the Congress is to provide us more resources, mm -hmm. we will use them judiciously for the purposes of improving safety. Sounds like a good answer to me. All right. Uh, Mr. Whitfield, uh, two minutes. I would just say I don't know how much more money we have to give you, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay, with that said, uh, and seeing no more members seeking recognition, uh, Mr. Administrator, you've done an excellent job. We thank you very much. And again, please forgive us, uh, but our duties have taken us away. And so we weren't able to uh, be as puffed as we uh, wanted to be as we, as we uh, beginning uh, this hearing. So thank you for your patience. No, thank you, Mr. Rush. It's been an honor. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Whitfield, thank you. The second panel uh, will please be seated at the desk. The chair thanks um, the second panel for your patience. And again, we want to reemphasize uh, our uh, apologies to you for uh, our schedule. There's been fairly horrendous and it's taken us away from our uh, schedule duties and uh, the votes on the floor. And so uh, please uh, accept our sincere apologies. Uh, the chair wants to introduce the witnesses now uh, that comprise the second panel. On my left is Ms. Joan Claybrook. Uh, she's the former administrator for the National Highway Safety, Traffic Safety, Traffic Safety uh, Administration. And, uh, Ms. Claybrook, we want to welcome you here once again. Right. Uh, sitting next to Ms. Claybrook is Ms. Uh, Ami uh, Gadhia. Uh, and Ms. Gadhia uh, is the Safety Policy Council for the Consumer Union. And uh, Ms. Gadhia, we want to welcome you also uh, to uh, this hearing. And lastly, we want to uh, not just recognize, but uh, we want to also um, say hello to our uh, former colleague who is a member of this house, uh, a very able member representing the uh, state of uh, Oklahoma for many years, a very bright and intelligent uh, human being, 
um, the Honorable David McCurdy, who is the president and the CEO of the Alliance for Automobile Manufacturers. And David's good to see you again, and uh, we welcome you again to uh, this uh, subcommittee's hearing. Uh, now we want to uh, recognize for five minutes for the purposes of an opening statement, the illustrious Ms. Joan Claybrook. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I uh, am the last person to have um, required an auto company to um, do a, a recall, and uh, that was the 31 years ago. And um, I would like to, to say that uh, when you do uh, find a defect, the auto companies will often do a recall, and you do not have to go to court. But uh, sometimes you do have to go to court. And I think that there's um, <clears throat> been, <clears throat> and the Toyota case, I think, um, elaborates on this. I think there's been a um, misconception on what a defect is. And in the last case uh, that was uh, litigated uh, by uh, the Department of Transportation on this issue, uh, um, the, uh, the Federal Court of Appeals uh, made several important comments, which I would just like to mention to you. This is not in my testimony. I hope that my whole testimony will be in the record. But I, I think that this is a very important issue. It's come up uh, now uh, several times uh, in recent days. Uh, what the court said was to find a defect within the meaning of the act, the NHTSA must show that the vehicle itself is defective. Whether the, the defect manifests itself in performance, construction, components, or materials of the automobile. In other words, it can be a performance defect, and they do not have to show that there are five or 500 or 10,000 consumer complaints that have arisen. And often, in fact, those complaints are not allowed in court as evidence. So if the agency relies on it, then it's not going to uh, find, have them find a, a successful result. Uh, judge Leventhal, who uh, was a Court of Appeals judge in a different case, said that a determination of a defect does not require any predicate of finding, um, of finding, identifying engineering, metallurgical, or manufacturing failures. A determination of a defect may be based exclusively on the performance record of the vehicle or component. So I think that this changes if you look at the Toyota case, and I know this is not just about Toyota, but it's about the agency. It changes the way the agency should approach these defect investigations. And I, I do think that the agency has um, fallen into a trap, if you would, uh, with the Toyota case and others, where it seems to be accepting the burden of having to define what the defect is in terms of the, the, the failure of performance. That's the responsibility of the manufacturer. The manufacturer put that vehicle together. They did the design drawings. They make the profit from it. And uh, how this happens is their responsibility. If it has a failure in performance, the agency can find a defect, and the company has to fix it. And the company has to figure out what that fix is. That's what the courts have said. And I think it's very important to, to uh, make that clear. Uh, my testimony um, that I submitted has seven points that I would like to just mention very briefly. One is that there has been a, a, a low priority on enforcement in the agency, a lack of resources, which you all have discussed. Um, but there's another key issue, which is that a court of appeals in the mid-1980s found that consumers did not have authority under the existing statute to sue if a defect was not found by the agency. In other words, if a case was closed, there was no authority of consumers to go to court. There, there is authority for consumers to go to court if a rulemaking decision is made that we don't think is proper. And we, in fact, have gone to court at Public Citizen on many, many occasions and helped to make the statute work better because of the cases that we have brought. We have brought them on uniform tire quality grading, on the, um, the tire uh, monitoring system for, for the amount of, uh, of uh, inflation in the tire, uh, on the early warning system, which was kept secret. Uh, totally secret. We at least got part of it revealed uh, in two different lawsuits. So we can sue when there's a rulemaking issue. We cannot sue when there's a defect is closed. And I think that changes the balance of thinking by the uh, administrator. There's no fear that if they close the case that it's finished. And what the court there said in, in um, the uh, Court of Appeals in the mid-'80s was that, um, that the agency had the discretion to figure it out according to their resources. And so in every case, that NHTSA closes. It says it closes it on the basis of resources. They just are mimicking the words of the court decision. 
But the fact is that we should have that authority because it should be, uh, we're not going to bring cases we don't think we can win because that's a waste of our time and energy. And I think that I think there ought to be a better balance of power because if the agency finds a defect, then the company gets a chance to uh, get its words and, and say what it thinks. And if we bring a case, they can intervene. Uh, secondly, uh, the agency has been engaged in excessive secrecy. The early warning system, which uh, Mr. Markey talked about, is a good example. And as I said, we had to sue to make it available. We don't even know uh, how many um, times Toyota, in the uh, recent cases, filed an early warning report to the agency and what it said and how many consumer complaints it had and how many warranty claims it had and how many field reports it had. All of that is secret. And if that were more open, then the public would have access to it, and they could help the agency by letting them know when they had a problem. If, if that, but their web page, in addition, is a mess. And so if you went to the web page to try and uh, figure out whether there have been um, early warning reports on a particular vehicle that you're driving that is not working right, you wouldn't be able to figure it out. I wouldn't be able to figure it out. The third point is that I think the penalties that the agency has authority to impose are insufficient. Uh, first, they should have the a criminal authority. Uh, for knowing and willful violation of the act, which is you put in the CPSC law most recently a year ago. It's in the FDA law. It's in many of the sister agency laws. I think the same should be available for NHTSA. And in addition, the penalty for the civil penalty is uh, $16.2 million, which is a fly spec for companies like Toyota. They spend that much in half a day on their communications uh, activities and staff. So. Um, we think that the, it ought to be $100 million uh, because that's something that they would pay attention to. Uh, fourth, the agency is drastically underfunded. The total budget for the motor vehicle program for the whole United States is $132 million in this agency. That's it. And uh, it's not much above what it was when I was there, just in dollars. And in terms of inflation, it's way below. It has been drastically cut. Um, by the way, those uh, 66 new FTEs that were being discussed, it's actually only 33 full-time ones. So it's, that's not really 66. And in addition, they have allocated them. 23 are for operations and research, 8 for rulemaking, 4 of them for enforcement. So that's the tentative allocation. Now, they may be changing that and reconsidering it, but that's uh, what was in the budget. Um, and uh, so the agency really cannot handle the programs, the rulemaking programs, which are critically important, as important certainly as the defect enforcement. Uh, because of lack of, of uh, capacity. Uh, information gathering and the data systems are totally insufficient. Uh, they should have been funded at four or five times what they are now, given the design of these systems back when they were first created in the 70s. Uh, I think that a key issue that has come up at this hearing to some extent is the black box. It's a voluntary standard. Voluntary standards don't work, as evidenced by the fact that Toyota uh, you know, his, his system is not even being made available. Uh, and the, de the deadline for compliance was supposed to be 2010. It was extended to 2012. So it's delayed by, so it's a five-year lead-in for a voluntary standard, which is ridiculous. And um, we think the black box ought to be mandatory and that the data that's, and ha have a standardized downloading for the data so that the police don't have to have, have seven different computers, depending on whether it's a General Motors car or Toyota or a Nissan or a Mercedes. They ought to have one standardized downloading system. And um, I think that, that a way that the agency could be drastically enhanced, it's very exciting, would be to have that black box data when it is downloaded, when a crash occurs, a serious crash, a, a towaway crash or an airbag crash, uh, to have that data go to NHTSA, have NHTSA set up a data system to receive it so that that can be the basis for their evaluation of defects and evaluation of, of st safety standards. And the data would be voluminous and it would be fabulous and far more than what they have today. And it would be much less expensive. So I hope that, that, that the uh, committee will consider uh, that issue as well. Um, the uh, new safety standards should come out of some of the work that goes on in the defects area. For example, for years, NHTSA has tested cars and seatbacks have failed when they, when they hit them in the rear at 30 miles an hour, and yet they've never issued a standard to upgrade that seatback. It's a very dangerous circumstance. If the seatback fails, you can't control the car. And you also, many people become quadriplegic and paraplegic as a result. But in the Toyota case, I think a, a, a brake override standard and a, uh, oops, uh, a brake override standard and a, um, uh, a, a new accelerator standard, which was issued in 1973 and doesn't, is not even electronic, so it's completely irrelevant to the current models uh, should be done. 
And then uh, finally, um, I believe that uh, conflict of interest rules need to be strengthened, as we've mentioned. Uh, and I would mention that um, NHTSA has a test facility in Ohio, but it's owned by Honda Motor Company. I created this back in the 70s when it was owned by the state of Ohio. Now it's owned by uh, Honda because they bought it. And I think that that should be changed. They should, they should change their facility, and there's some opportunities for doing that. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I have several submissions for the record. I'm sorry that uh, I slightly overwent my time. Mm. Uh, the chair, uh, uh, by unanimous, unanimous consent, will uh, accept the, the extraneous material uh, and your full statement into the record. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ms. Uh, Gadhia, uh, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Chairman Rush, Ranking Member Whitfield, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify on the road ahead for NHTSA. I am Ami Gadia, Policy Counsel with Consumers Union, the nonprofit publisher of Consumer Reports. The recent Toyota recalls involving sudden unintended acceleration have focused national attention on safety problems. Consumers Union believes that addressing this formidable challenge demands a co coordinated effort by the government, automakers, the public, and independent consumer groups such as our own. We recommend the following government actions to improve our auto safety net. Consumers Union believes government regulators could have moved more aggressively to pursue sudden unintended acceleration and to protect consumers' safety. Various news reports and our own analysis of documents from the investigation point to a pattern of missed opportunities. NHTSA and Toyota were aware of unintended acceleration complaints involving Toyota models as early as 2003, when the agency received a petition to investigate the problem. We are pleased that NHTSA is now looking into potential electronics issues behind the events involving Toyotas, and we eagerly await the agency's findings. However, we believe that NHTSA can take actions now to improve safety. First, we would like to see improved public access to safety information. NHTSA's Office of Defects Investigations collects complaints and data about autos from the public and manufacturers in two separate databases. The Consumer Complaints Database and the agency's early warning reporting system. But both have limitations, and the data they provide are not integrated, making it more difficult for investigators to spot issues and for consumers to find information. Consumers shouldn't have to visit different sites to see all of this information or be forced to search it using tools that are less than user-friendly. All complaint information should be visible via, via a single, easy-to-use, consumer-facing site. NHTSA should also initiate a program to raise public awareness and invite more drivers to participate in data gathering. The more public complaints there are to analyze, the greater the chance that problems such as unintended acceleration will be identified at an early stage. Second, NHTSA should promulgate certain safety regulations to prevent sudden unintended acceleration in all automobiles. They should require that cars be able to stop within a reasonable distance with a sustained press on the brake pedal, even when the throttle is fully open. One method to reduce stopping distances is smart throttle technology that allows the brakes to override the throttle. Other methods may also become available. To us, the most important safety feature is to ensure that a vehicle can stop within a reasonable and safe distance. NHTSA should require simple, standard controls that can easily turn off the engine in an emergency. In many current Toyota vehicles, when the car is moving, it requires a sustained three-second push of the button to turn off the engine. Though that is a safety precaution to prevent accidental engine shutoff, it is an action many owners may not be able to do in a panicked situation. Ignition controls should be easy to operate, especially in an emergency. NHTSA should require intuitive, clearly labeled transmission shifters in all cars. If your car is accelerating out of control, hitting the brakes and shifting into neutral is your best strategy. But you want to know where neutral is when you are panicking. There should be consistency for shifters across all vehicles. NHTSA should also require a minimum distance between the gas pedal and the floorboard. Floor mats that entrap pedals have been a major focus in re recent recalls. But people frequently use thick mats or ill-fitting mats or stack the mats uh, on top of each other. NHTSA should ensure that there is sufficient clearance between the pedal and the floor mat. We also think that NHTSA's cap on civil penalties should be lifted to act as a deterrent against future violations and that NHTSA could improve the recall compliance process. The average consumer response rate to vehicles is 74.1%. 
Currently, manufacturers notify dealers about recalls, and the dealers, in turn, notify car manufacturers once the cars are repaired in response to a safety recall. Consumers Union suggests that going forward, car manufacturers submit such data to NHTSA. This information, which manufacturers already have, should include individual vehicle identification numbers, or VINs, of cars that are subject to a particular recall, as well as when the recall repairs were, per were performed on the vehicles. NHTSA would then be able to match up safety recalls with the manufacturer provided VIN in a consumer friendly searchable database. We would further encourage states to consider linking safety recall compliance with the ability to obtain a vehicle registration, similar to the way consumers must show proof of insurance to register their cars now. This would help people who purchase used cars to know whether recall repairs have been made. We also recommend that Congress take a look at the reports of a revolving door at NHTSA and whether this may have impacted safety decisions. We are pleased to hear today the administrator's uh, comment that the administration will be looking, uh, excuse me, that, that NHTSA will be looking into this particular issue. Finally, we urge Congress to adequately fund NHTSA. In 2007, motor vehicle crashes accounted for 99% of all transportation-related injuries and fatalities. Yet NHTSA's budget currently amounts to just over 1% of the overall DOT budget. The agency's budget and staffing for auto safety and consumer protection functions should be commensurate with the realities of traffic safety. Consumers Union thanks the committee for the opportunity to present its recommendations as you move forward. Uh, the chair thanks you, the witness. <clears throat> the chair now uh, recognizes uh, Mr. Uh, McCurdy for five minutes for the purposes of an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Ranking Member Whitfield for the opportunity to uh, appear and uh, speak on behalf of the industry as a whole. Um, I, I must admit, uh, as you made your introduction, I, there was some uh, chagrin I, on my personal part uh, when I looked at the, the membership of this subcommittee in that I actually served with the fathers of three of the members. So. Uh, <laughs> It is a homecoming of sorts, but uh, I hadn't thought I'd been gone that long. But, uh, it's good to, good to be back with mm -hmm. you. Um, as uh, you and your colleagues consider the road ahead for National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, it is important to remember three key points. The administrator, who we are all delighted that uh, David Strickland is now the administrator of, uh, of NHTSA, as he pointed out in uh, the Department of Transportation uh, highlighted today, and actually uh, I have a chart uh, that's uh, displayed here, that uh, motor vehicle crash fatalities and injuries are at historic lows. It's a very, very important part because, uh, point because that's the mission of uh, the organization. Secondly, autos have never been safer, and they're still getting safer every day because of innovative safety technologies, including advanced electronics. And third, we need to be careful not to inhibit the innovation or the speedy identification and remedy of defects. On the first point, uh, as the chart indicates, uh, sometimes when you see a chart like that, it's confusing for folks. But to, to put it in perspective, uh, this decline, uh, this, this figure reports as a a fatality per 100 million vehicle miles traveled. So there are 1.16 uh, fatalities per 100 million miles traveled. That's down from uh, in excess of uh, two. Uh, but to that, put that in terms of, of, of human lives, and again, we all know that this is far too many. Uh, that's a significant reduction from uh, Joan, Joan Claybrook would indicate uh, back in the 70s when it was at a high of 51,000. Now that's a decrease of 17,000. So I think that's a very important point that there is a significant and steady reduction despite increased ownership and increased vehicle miles traveled. So I think this is uh, a goal that we share and we want to continue to work uh, to support. As far as the, the, the safety of vehicles, um, you know, by every single measure, 
these vehicles are dramatically safer than years ago. Uh, and in the last 15 years, we've seen a revolutionary expansion of advanced vehicle safety technologies, including an increased number of electronic components and features. Uh, Mr. Braley mentioned uh, being able to take uh, a part of a carburetor and engine in the, in the basement. It is indeed uh, impossible to do that today. Uh, but a lot of the, the technologies that we see uh, for, to meet um, fuel economy requirements, to meet emission controls, to provide safety are because of these advanced electronics. Uh, also, uh, Ms. Claybrook said that voluntary standards don't work, but in fact, many of the incredible safety innovations were voluntary and were brought about before the agency ever considered regulating it. Electronic stability control. Electronic stability control saves anywhere from uh, 5,000 to 9,000 lives uh, annually. Uh, lane departure warning, over 2,700 lives. Safety belt reminders uh, and safety belt interlock, again, significant side airbags. Forward collision warning, emergency brake assist, adaptive headlights, uh, blind spot information system. All of these are innovations that the industry introduced ahead of regulation. Uh, secondly, <coughs> the, it's really important to recognize that electronic systems are often far more reliable over time than mechanical systems. Uh, I used to represent the electronics industry, and I would tell you that the advancements in solid state technology uh, provides uh, increased performance. It enables uh, vehicles to not only sense, diagnose, and uh, also to have fail-safe modes that are not possible with traditional, historic, mechanical systems. So this is a very uh, significant uh, technology which is helping us to, to meet our goals of sustainable mobility. And third, as I indicated, I think we really have to be careful not to inhibit this cycle of innovation because this industry innovates more rapidly and gets into the marketplace um, technologies for consumers. Uh, and so we need to maintain a policy framework that embraces technology-based solutions ahead of regulation. And I don't think we'd be, the public would be well served if automakers were forced to wait for the government to catch up with industry's innovation. And it's also important, we've talked a lot about recalls, but the vast majority of recalls are voluntary. And I have a chart here uh, talking about detecting and correcting def defects sooner. Uh, in fact, the number of recalls are up. Some may say, well, isn't that a sign of problems? In fact, that's a good point because the number of vehicles affected are coming down, so automakers are using the recall system based on data it receives, not only from the consumer directly, but also from the agencies, to initiate these actions to identify the defects and get them remedied and get the vehicles back into the, uh, the marketplace. And then just in closing, uh, I, I want to make a couple points about some suggestions for this committee. And I appreciate, uh, I know how this chairman works and I know how this committee works, and uh, you want to build a consensus on a bipartisan basis to uh, address uh, significant concerns. Uh, we would respectfully submit that uh, Congress really does need to ensure that NHTSA has the resources to do its job, and, and we would support uh, this committee and its efforts. We've long advocated additional resources to fund the National Automobile Sampling System, the NAS system, which we believe is uh, underfunded. Uh, we also support a number of other legislative elements that we hope would be included in this reauthorization, such as state inducements, in other words, working to encourage states to adopt primary enforcement safety belt laws. Uh, I know that uh, Chairman Oberstar is looking at this in his reauthorization. Uh, our industry spent uh, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in campaign to try to pass primary seat belt enforcement laws across the country. And we've made real progress. We had three states uh, this year alone. Uh, we also believe there should be a first offense for, uh, with an ignition interlock requirements for impaired driving, drunk driving. Uh, the statistics that's not reported up there are the 33,000 deaths. Unfortunately, 30% of those or more are by, are the result of less than 1%, one half of 1% of the drivers and those that are impaired and drunk driving. We have to get those people off the road. 
And then lastly, the graduated license laws for teens based on best practices, uh, the Stand Up Act, uh, we support that. And um, then there are other things that can uh, really work to fund support high visibility enforcement efforts such as Click It or Ticket uh, and other limit uh, under arrest uh, or over the limit uh, under arrest uh, provisions. And again, there's an opportunity to support a driver alcohol interlake, uh, interlocked uh, device research program called Roads Safe Act, which uh, puts money to try to develop research to prevent drunk drivers uh, getting uh, access to vehicles or starting vehicles. So uh, with, we appreciate very much your work. I understand how challenging it is. And uh, we look forward to working with you to help develop uh, common sense uh, solutions to some of these challenges. <coughs> Uh, the Chair thanks the, uh, all the witnesses and um, the Chair thanks Mr. McCurdy for your, your statement. Uh, the Chair recognizes himself for uh, five minutes for questioning. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. McCurdy, there's been a lot of testimony uh, in this hearing and in past hearing, and some of it is centered on the black box as a, as a, uh, as a, technological um, solution or not necessarily a recording device that would help uh, in um, gathering the data and also determining the uh, causes for accidents. Uh, what is the industry's response uh, to this phenomenon of the black box? We believe the, um, the information from event data recorders uh, is important for NHTSA to, to do its job. They do have a rule that uh, has standardized or recommended standards for the type of data that would be uh, acquired. Uh, I think the industry is moving uh, rapidly towards uh, deployment of that system. Over 60% of all vehicles today, uh, modern vehicles, have that uh, capability. The only caution I would give, and, and again, having come from the intelligence and defense world when we talk about black boxes or we come from the world of, of aerospace where some people think that in an aircraft there's this black box that they recover after an accident. Uh, actually these uh, data systems are embedded throughout uh, vehicles and so it's not just one solitary uh, device. But it's important that, uh, that, that there are commercially available tools to, to access that. Uh, so I think the agency is uh, going to be uh, addressing this, and we look forward to working with them. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is something that can, uh, mm -hmm. can be addressed. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Claybrook, <clears throat> you uh, indicated that you think that, first, uh, that NISA's current budget is uh, inadequate, and that, NIS, uh, that the president's budget uh, for this year, uh, for next year, rather, is uh, inadequate. Uh, what do you think, as a former administrator, in today's dollars, how much do you think this budget should be in? What do you, what do you think it should, uh, should be in categories uh, that we should look at um, increasing uh, both personnel and other resources for, for NHTSA? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think that the, do the budget should be doubled. Uh, it's $132 million, which is a pittance by any measure in the federal government, and uh, it should probably be doubled the year after that. Uh, this agency is starving to death. It can't do the research it should. It can't collect the data that it should. It doesn't have the expertise that it should. Um, it doesn't have the enforcement personnel that it should. And um, it's, all of us are, suffer from that because of deaths on the highway. And uh, I think that Mr. Strickland is going to be a good leader for this agency. I'm looking forward to see his work. And um, I, th I think he needs the resources to do it. And uh, I've already been talking to him and the secretary a little bit about this. And I think his answer was very appropriate, that they would use very wisely the resources that the Congress decided that they would give to the agency. He didn't say we didn't want them or that they couldn't use them. He said that they, they would use them wisely. And I think that's as far as he's allowed to go under the, the president's rules. And I'm very pleased to see that he said that. Uh, <clears throat> you have given us seven. <clears throat> I would uh, comment one other thing, Mr. Chairman, which is that uh, issues have been raised today about the, um, the reduction in death and injury on the highway, which is magnificent. 
But I would also point out that after the oil crisis of 1973, there was a reduction of 9,000 deaths a year uh, because the economy was in the sink. And I think that uh, if you look at uh, the, the documents that are prepared by the agency itself, um, for example, here is their list that they put out today of their crash stats. Uh, you will see that every time there is a downturn in the economy, there is less discretionary driving and there is a downturn in death and injury. But it comes right back up again. And so uh, should anyone suggest that this is a permanent fix for the agency, it is not. I think that, um, that you are still going to need those resources, new safety standards, and there are many others that I didn't mention today, which I will submit a list of for the record, uh, other safety standards that are, uh, the agency is woefully behind in issuing. Mr. Chairman, may I in just one point on that? Just clarification. I think the administrator said that it actually had decreased and declined for 15 and a half straight quarters. That's more than the current recession. So I think this is a long-term trend. It's because of the the regulatory efforts and is because of the work of uh, the industry cooperatively with that agency and also work the, the work of Congress. Well, I would say that, that, the, uh, that the acting administrator, the one who went to Japan, Mr. Medford, he uh, gave a presentation, which I will also submit for the record, in which he said that um, safety technologies had uh, between 1960 and uh, 2000 saved 328,551 lives. And so I do agree. I agree with Mr. McCurdy that cars are safer today. Um, I am disappointed that the industry often opposes some of those improvements, but they also do take initiatives on their own, which he's mentioned. Uh, and uh, these safety features can make a huge difference. They have made a difference in the number of lives saved. And, and the, the, the number of deaths on the highway today would be far, far greater were not this agency doing its work. Uh, but there is much more that can be done, and we will see more deaths and injuries when the economy. My, my time has expired. Uh, the Chair recognizes Mr. Whitfield for five minutes. Thank you. This has been uh, quite an interesting hearing. And of course, any time we think we talk about uh, death on a highway, uh, and all of us have known people who have been killed in car accidents or have had loved ones or have been disfigured, and there is no way not to be emotional about individual deaths on a highway. But, you know, I'm walking away from this hearing feeling a little bit better, really, about things, understanding that the uh, uh, Toyota issue is out there. But when you have this kind of a reduction in the deaths per 100 million miles from in, this, in the middle, middle 70s, 3.34 fatalities per 100 million vehicle miles, down to last year 1.16 per 100 million miles, and it doesn't really make any difference what the economy is or is not. It's, we're talking about 100 million vehicle miles. So I think that's something we really should celebrate to see that the fact that this fatality rate is coming down. Now, when we talk about the budget of NHTSA, uh, I think the total budget is somewhere in the neighborhood of $900 million, but a lot of that goes to state grants. And uh, you all may be more familiar with those state grants than I am, and I know that Ms. Claybrook is right as far as vehicle safety. There's about $132 million a year for vehicle safety. But I referred earlier, for example, to this congressionally mandated study in 2005 about the causes of vehicle accidents. And it said that 95 percent were due to the driver, primarily driver mistakes. And that, uh, and 2 percent, by the way, were related to vehicle or equipment defect, but about 40 percent or 50 percent of that related to tires. So I'm just wondering if maybe we should look at this in a different way and try to start focusing more money uh, on uh, educating drivers, better educational programs for drivers. And, you know, every state sets their own um, laws for how old you have to be and what kind of program you have to go through to drive. Uh, sh should we, because of the fact that 95 percent of all accidents are caused primarily because of driver or neglect or whatever, should we be focusing on more programs to uh, provide better educational opportunities for drivers to make them better prepared. 
And I would just ask each one of you that question and see how you would respond to that. Uh, well, first of all, uh, Mr. Whitfield, thank you so much for pointing uh, this out, and I appreciate your question. Um, first of all, uh, I'd like to submit for the record the problems that we see with this, this uh, causation uh, study. Uh, it's quite complicated, and I don't want to take the time today, but there are a lot of deficiencies in it. But even assuming that 95 percent of the uh, crashes occur because of driver error, uh, Is your that speaker on? I'm sorry? Is your speaker on? Yeah, I'm sorry, it is on. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, even assuming that, uh, which I don't, that 95 percent of the, of the crashes were, are, occur because of driver error, what you have to look at is what causes the death and injury. A and um, Dr. William Haddon, who was the first NHTSA administrator, uh, put together what he called the, the Haddon Matrix. And it had pre-crash, crash, and post-crash. And what you're talking about is the pre-crash uh, issue, which is drunk driving, um, falling asleep, uh, brakes don't work, wh whatever it may be in the pre-crash yeah. field. Well, Ms. Claybrook, I, there's only about a minute left, so I'm just going to say that you disagree with what I was saying, I'm assuming. that. Well, no, not necessarily. I, I, I will submit for the record the information on that. But, but what you want to do is to protect the driver and the, and the occupants, and the way you do that is making sure the car is safe, okay. regardless of what causes the crash. Okay. And on driver education, NHTSA itself has done lots of work on this okay. and shown that driver education really doesn't do much okay. in terms of the long-term yeah. driving capability yeah. of, of most people. What about you, I, Ms. I, I like driver education, yeah. but I mean, it doesn't. What about you, Ms. Gaudio? Do you have any comments on that? Um, in our testimony that we submitted for the record, um, we took a look at um, the question that the committee is asking, and in the light of all the recalls that we've seen in recent weeks, are there areas that we see for uh, improvement? Um, and so we've made our recommendations accordingly. Um, we are pleased, though, that the agency uh, and Secretary LaHood have put a great focus on distracted driving. Right. That's something that's been um, uh, and obviously a big problem. So we do see a, a value in that particular kind of focus. Mr. McCurdy. Thank you, Mr. Uh, excuse me. Thank you, uh, Mr. Whitfield. Uh, in fact, uh, in addition to uh, driver behavior and performance, there's the driving environment, so the condition of roads, the uh, uh, lack of safety features there, uh, weather, et cetera, is, is a factor in 2 percent. And then in 2 percent, um, uh, in the other instances, about 2 percent, uh, it can be attributed to uh, uh, the vehicle. But I would tell you, uh, since we had a reference to older vehicles, uh, I'll provide uh, a record, or for the record, a um, copy of our playbook, and it's uh, new. Uh, it has an interesting photograph of a 50 anniversary uh, event at the National Institute of Highway Safety, uh, the Insurance Institute, and they did a 40-mile-an-hour uh, head-on crash of two vehicles. One was a 1959 Chevrolet Bel Air. We're not picking on Chevy. It's actually a good story here. <laughs> As you know, in 1959, well, some of you probably weren't around then, but uh, most of us who were know that's a lot of metal there. A 40-mile-an-hour head-on crash with a 2009 Chevy Malibu, which is a smaller car, uh, and the the results are dramatic. The cage the front seat, the passenger area of the 59, uh, those, those passengers would have been killed. Uh, there's no, no doubt. I mean, they were severely injured, you know, tremendous uh, impact, uh, crushing of that compartment. In the new model, the cage is intact. It also has front airbags, side airbags, side curtains, uh, and the technology in the new one also has uh, other features that uh, uh, improve the likelihood of survival in a head-on crash, regardless of the cause, whether it's someone swerving. Uh, the last point I'd make in, in this uh, comment made about uh, the three-second uh, stop. Uh, I drive a vehicle that has push-button on-stop. That is one of the features that many, many consumers uh, are, are moving towards. Um, are we asking that, are we saying that consumers today it's in, the, it's in the manual, it's in the instruction and all the rest. Can't take three seconds to, to push a button. Uh, I know that we panic. I know there are instances. Uh, but there is a need for education. There is a need. And maybe one of the positive uh, uh, aspects of all this investigation, all the reporting, is that maybe consumers are having to pay attention to actually the vehicles that they're driving. Uh, what are those shifters? Where is neutral? Uh, my son-in-law drives a, a Camry. 
when this came up, when one's in the recall, I said, he's asked, what do you do? I said, you put it in neutral, okay? You don't want to turn it off at first, and those buttons are there, and that three-second delay is there for a reason, because you don't want inadvertent shutting off the engine, because then you could lose power. That affects steering and other conditions. So I think there's a common sense approach that we need to take. Let's find out what it is. You know, let's work together. And I think that's what NHTSA and the, the industry uh, should be um, discussing. So there's not one solution, but I think there is a, a genuine concern about it and a genuine way to, to try to develop uh, some solutions. Mr. Chairman, may I briefly respond to the comment about mm -hmm. the push buttons? Certainly. Um, I would like to note that our recommendations have to do with uh, when the consumer is in an emergency situation, since we have been talking about sudden unintended acceleration. Um, and I will note also that uh, given what's happened, uh, it's my, not, it's my understanding that Toyota is working on um, reconfiguring their push button ignition so it can be turned off in an emergency situation with multiple quick presses in a short period of time. So that's what we're talking about. Thank you. The chair, the chair recognizes the gentlelady from Illinois for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to apologize to the witnesses for not uh, being here for a testimony, though I have looked at it. I, I want to also just take this uh, moment to um, say what a tremendous resource we have in Joan Claybrook, who did serve as head of, of NHTSA. And I th hope that uh, our, not only our subcommittee, but that NHTSA right now will take advantage of all of the um, years of experience she's had, not only as an administrator, but as uh, a, an advocate. I thank uh, Ms. Gadia and also um, Mr. McCurdy for the, the work that, that you're doing. But I, I wanted to particularly just uh, thank Joan for um, decades, I won't say how many, of uh, being an advocate uh, for, for consumers. Um, in looking at the priorities that you laid out um, for um, legislative and administrative, I mean, there's a couple things that are clearly legislative. If, if you think that penalties need to be enhanced, I think that's uh, legislative on, on our part. But um, uh, what, what are those things that you think the committee in particular has to deal with and that um, really can't be done administratively to meet the goals that you've set out or that the problems you've identified? Well, I would say uh, certainly... Do you have your mic on? Okay. Yeah, sorry. I would say certainly uh, in the uh, penalty area that uh, that's, a, uh, that's a legislative issue. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in the um, funding, that's a, a legislative issue. The, the President's budget is what it is, and it's totally insufficient. And so uh, you ha the, it's not this committee's responsibility, although you do authorize, of course. Um, I think that uh, in the area of transparency, there have been some decisions made by the agency that this committee could change. In the Early Warning Act, while there was a lot of discussion about being, uh, the uh, information being open, in fact, the way that it was written uh, was interpreted as not being open. So I think that it would help for clarification uh, on on transparency with the early warning system, because uh, right now it's not available to any of us. Um, and that would require a change or a clarification in I, law? Or? I think it would be, uh, yes, I think it would be very helpful okay. to have a clarification of that. Um, in terms of uh, consumers being able to uh, bring a lawsuit when um, the uh, decision is, uh, a, a case is closed in, in, in the enforcement area, uh, we definitely need to have legislation there because of the Court of Appeals decision. Uh, and um, then uh, I think it would be very helpful uh, to have some legislative support for um, improving the black box. This is something that could be done administratively by the agency. I think it would be really helpful because um, if the black box is mandatory, if it has, gathers a lot of really good data, if it can be downloaded easily, all of that data can come into NHTSA's re uh, data system. And it would vastly enhance, excitingly enhance, the capacity of the agency to analyze problems, to find out what's going on on the highway, because this would be rich information from, from, from our crashes that occur right then on the highway. Uh, and this information is totally lacking in the agency now. And gathering it through the NAS system 
uh, which is this National Accident Sampling System, which is after the fact accident investigations. There was intended to be 20,000 of them a year. It's now 4,000 because of the cost. And this, I think, will we'll never get to the 20,000. So why not take advantage of, of this data that's going to be collected anyway in black boxes under what I think has to be a mandate uh, for the black box itself and use that data for the uh, operations of the agency as well as particular crashes? Mr. McCurdy, you're, you seem to be nodding at, at that. Did you want to comment on this? Thank you, ma'am. Um, Actually, I did want to comment. We, we asked for additional resources for NAS. We think that data needs to be uh, collected. Uh, and this committee has oversight of NITS and the data uh, is there, but we need to make sure that the agency has the tools and resources to, to gather it. My only caveat on that, and mm -hmm. I think this is something that, that we need to work on, is I don't believe that the wholesale release of raw and unverified data would further the objective of quickly identifying correcting defects. Uh, and if, in, if anything, it may lead to more litigation. And I don't believe that's the, the answer. Oh, well, I should say, Mr. McCurdy, uh, I apologize. I actually have the mic, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, I don't believe it uh, would, in fact, uh, do that. Um, I would hope before the gentlelady leaves, or we at least have another round, actually talk about uh, one of the principal issues that you're the key sponsor of, which we supported the Cameron Gobranson Act and the role that we actually played because uh, this is one of our priorities and it shows where we can actually work together to address significant problems. And it is, um, it, those are the most, some of the most tragic instances that, that we know. And Thank I worked you. Uh, with uh, Senator Sununu and Senator Clinton at the time, exactly. as well as your staff and the staff uh, of the committee uh, to make that happen. And, and the industry fully supported that. So I want to make sure that's on the record as well. And, and I you. appreciate that. Yeah. Um, I, I is, there, is there any uh, way, Mr. Chairman, that uh, Ms. Claybrook can respond back to that? Or do you want well, to? Uh, it's it, just it, privacy information. I just want to make clear that I don't think that this data should be public as to individual crashes. It would be for statistical purposes. That's okay. all I wanted to say. Thank you. All right. The gentleman's time has expired. And the chair recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Stearns, for. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Claiborne, just. Uh, Ms. Claybrook, let me just follow up what Ms. Schakowsky has uh, talked about. In this boxes, isn't the box that it's on a person's car? That box but would belong to that person, wouldn't it? Yes. So wouldn't they have the right to opt out if they wanted to? Could well, they flick a switch so that if they didn't want this to occur, they could do it? Or do you think that should not be? I don't think there ought to be an on off switch. OK, so you think there should be no opt out? I do not, I do not think there should be an opt out. OK. Uh, secondly, the information they collect is obviously speed, perhaps location. Is it going to go beyond that in terms of weight in the car? or um, driving habits, what in your opinion? On the black box? In the black box. Because uh, well, it sounds like you want to expand it. And I think, I think many people are concerned about how the federal government will handle this data. Uh, if I don't want, say I can't opt out of the box under your, your uh, persuasion, then if it goes to the federal government, how is this, is this going to be public on the internet? Uh, should be private citizens be able to go and see that about their neighbors who are driving? And I mean, there are some I privacy Im implications, yeah, I, I think, that, that I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about. I really appreciate you asking the question because I certainly didn't mean to suggest that uh, everyone's driving crash should, every crash that occurs should be publicly exposed on the internet with the name of the person and their car and all the rest of it. Uh, the black box generally uh, collects data 20 to 5 seconds before a crash and five to ten. So it doesn't seconds. come on doesn't all during on. the whole no. time? No. Okay. And so it's very, very limited time frame. And what it records is whether your foot was on the accelerator, whether it was on the brake, uh, um, a lot of uh, aspects of the engine itself, the speed of the vehicle, and so on. And um, that data, when I'm talking about having to go to the federal government, it would be only statistical data. All uh, privacy information would be erased. So the federal government wouldn't even have it. It would, it, would, it would just be statistical data. It would just be that a crash occurred and what the circumstances were so that you can then accumulate that data and say, this is, these are the kind of crashes that are occurring and these are the kind of uh, remedies that we need to think about applying because of that. So um, 
I, I do think it needs to be mandatory. I think it should be in every vehicle. Uh, actually, General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler uh, readily reveal uh, the contents uh, of their black boxes in litigation because they think it's advantageous. To them. Well, I, I think I guess I guess you know this committee would be concerned about the privacy. Let me move on. I have another question, uh, Mr. McCurdy. Uh, welcome to the committee. It's nice to see you. Uh, Eddie Towns and I dropped a bill on January uh, 28, 2009, uh, which would direct the Department of Transportation to issue regulations uh, which would mitigate the safety hazard caused by near silent hybrid and electric cars. Uh, I was in a parking lot going into uh, the, the grocery store, and I was just walking in line, wasn't thinking on my Blackberry, and I, this car came up that was a hybrid, and I didn't hear it, and it practically hit me. And so my question is, um, I think both General Motors and uh, NHTSA uh, have come up and proposed methods to address this, uh, and I guess concerning the ever-increasing desire now to have these cars that are hybrids and silent and you can't hear them, uh, Winston Churchill almost got killed when he came to the United States and got off the wrong side of the road, and uh, certainly if these cars are silent, he might not have been alive, and so uh, I guess in concern with the ever-increasing danger in the uh, sort of the inconsistency of the industry response so far. Do you think NHTSA needs to take further action to ensure an industry-wide solution, perhaps something like uh, Congressman Towns and I, the bill we introduced, uh, which is called the Pedestrian, Pedestrian Safety Enhancement Act of 2009. It has 210 co-sponsors. It's H.R. 734. I know the bill well, uh, and uh, it's good to see you, Mr. Stearns. Actually, uh, we refer to this as the quiet car uh, uh, legislation and uh, concern. Actually, I think we ought to recognize, I don't know if John is still here, John Perret from the National Federation of the Blind. Uh, we at the Alliance have been working closely with NFB. Uh, we've been, uh, our member companies have been conducting uh, acoustic testing. Uh, there are some challenges. You know, it's ironic, unintended consequences, but we've been pushed by, for years by some to say we've got to reduce noise. We've been pushed by <laughs> others to say we've got to eliminate the internal combustion. No one's ever happy. You know, so, here, so we're moving uh, uh, you know, rapidly uh, to um, hybrid and electric uh, technology, and uh, they are quiet, if not silent. Um, I, I can't resist the point, though, when you say that you're walking with your Blackberry and don't <laughs> hear it. It's a little bit of distracted walking. No, and, it's my uh, we're, fault. We're mixing issues here, but no, we'll talk about distracted driving, too. But uh, the, the important But I am is, a pedestrian, and, the, yeah. and I have the right of way That's right. <laughs> with the hybrid. I actually, uh, I spoke to the uh, NFB convention uh, oh, did you? earlier okay. in the year uh, when they were in Detroit. Uh, uh, quite, uh, quite an event. Uh, I think uh, they will tell you that we've reached out uh, to them. We've worked closely with them. What we're trying to do is understand the challenges here um, to, to really understand what the, the acoustic is. there a timeline? Can you give yeah, me a timeline? Yeah, I think we can. Well, we've been doing the research now. Uh, I think there's questions of length of implementation, but uh, I think we're not far from, from finding a solution. A year, two years? And we. On, depends on front end and back. Uh, I, I think we're actually making real progress. And uh, again, and we want NHTSA to engage with us as well. So I think there's an opportunity for a real stakeholder conversation here. And it's not, a, um, it's not confrontational at all. I think this is a question of, of, of It's really a, a question of really understanding the problem and bringing to, uh, to, to bear the right uh, science and engineering. But I think there will be a solution, and I think it can be And you think NHTSA, NHTSA should have an uh, in industry-wide solution? Yes, it no. should be industry-wide. I think it's actually going to be global. Uh, okay. I'm involved internationally, and I think Japan Thank is you, Mr. actively engaged, and others will as well. Recognize Mr. Brady for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Stearns, there's a great episode on the TV show The Office where one of the characters engages in a low-speed chase with the Prius and sneaks up on one of the other characters, uh, <laughs> which demonstrates the importance of this legislation. Uh, Mr. McCurdy, you know, rel voluntary can be a relative thing. And you talked earlier about some of the voluntary changes the industry had made to respond to safety concerns, but a lot of those changes that were made were also things that the industry initially resisted. 
And one of the great things about the country we live in is we have a system that allows people from all different walks of life to work together both in a public setting like through NHTSA and through our private enforcement methods to try to hold people accountable and work together to improve the technology in automobiles. You mentioned that you had concerns about the use of uh, electronic data recorder information and said, suggested it could lead to more litigation. I would challenge that statement because I believe if you had a system with standards for accessing and downloading that information and a clear understanding of what it represented, you could actually reduce litigation. Because right now, much of the expense in a lot of these crashworthiness cases is people trying to understand how an accident occurred, how the occupant compartment was compromised and potentially contributed to the fatality or the severity of the crash. So one of the things that I'm interested in hearing from you is we've been talking about the standards for electronic data recorders, and there's already been some uh, proposals, both by, by the uh, um, Institute for Electrical Engineers and also proposed regulations that NHTSA is considering. And it's been my impression that some members of your alliance have been uh, objecting to the enactment of those regulations. Are you able to make a statement here at the hearing today on behalf of the Alliance that it supports the enactment of standardized regulations by NHTSA that govern the use of electronic data recorder information? I believe we're moving in that direction. I'll, I'll put it that way. I think the industry, there's a, well over 64 percent, I think is the most recent number, maybe it's 2005 models that have EDRs, event that I, I may have, we may have been confused on all the information. I think some of the early warning information, I think, is where we have some, some concerns. The type of information in the EDR is, is probably less of, of a concern. Uh, but again, I think there can be uh, movement on this. Um, and, I, and again, I think the, the stakeholders uh, in working with NHTSA have, have an opportunity. Um, my hesitation was because of my experience in the electronic field is that again some people have a very simplistic idea of, of what that is so it's not quite as simple as just saying everyone's going to have a, a quote a black box but i think we're moving in that direction well and uh, Ms. Gotti, i want to talk to you about that because in your written statement you said the edr information must also be standardized and expanded and Mr. Stearns began his question by asking uh, Ms. Claybrook about the ownership of that data and assumed that it belonged to the owner of the vehicle. And yet, during the early years of EDR data availability, the manufacturers frequently took the position that was proprietary information that belonged to them, not the person who paid for the automobile. So how do we move forward from this point to try to come up with a system that makes easily available and downloadable information that achieves the privacy concerns we're worried about but provides us with better data that helps us solve the underlying problems that leads to occupant injury. Um, as we noted in our, in our written testimony that um, the NHTSA regulation is going to require uh, EDRs to collect the cars that do have EDRs to collect certain standardized amounts of data for 2013 model year cars. We'd like to see that happen sooner. We think there's a safety utility to the information that they collect. Um, but there are some privacy concerns about ownership of the data, as you mentioned, uh, Representative Braley. And in the past, Consumers Union has uh, submitted comments to NHTSA as they were considering the regulation that they, the final rule that they put forward in 2006. And I would be happy to, to share that with your office. Please do. That would be much appreciated. Okay. And Ms. Claybrook, I want to finish with you. One of the things that we know from the medical field is a process called differential diagnosis. And that's when a physician is presented with a sick patient. They come up with a hierarchy of the possible causes of their illness, beginning with the most likely and descending to the least likely. And then the physician testing and evaluation to try to rule out what could be causing the illness wow. to be able to reach a final diagnosis and a plan of treatment. And one of the concerns I have with the response we've seen to some of the problems with the Toyota recall is that the differential diagnosis that Toyota engaged in was limited, it appeared to many of us, to a mechanical failure. And they have now participated in massive recalls 
to address sticky accelerator pedals and problems with floor mats. And yet we still see reports of sudden and anticipated acceleration in vehicles where those retrofits have been made. So can you comment based in, on your experience as a former NIST administrator and as somebody involved in a long period of public safety advocacy on what you think needs to be done to get to the underlying cause? Well, um, Toyota is the only company, the only entity that can do that. They designed the vehicle, they created the software, they uh, have software engineers who did it. Uh, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration should not design the remedy. It never has, in any case ever. And uh, it doesn't have the capacity to do the kind of evaluation that is necessary to figure out what the underlying cause is. A lot of people have said that figuring out a software glitch is almost impossible in some cases, particularly if no marker is left, uh, that this glitch even occurred uh, a marker left in the computer. And so that's why a lot of people have talked about the uh, brake override as the only possible solution because we just don't, at least we don't know, maybe Toyota does, but we don't know what the problem is. I think it's very interesting that Toyota has said it's a, it's a, a floor mat recall of five million cars and yet the remedy that they're putting in most of those cars is not only to remove or fix the pedal and the floor mat, but to put in a brake override system, which is an electronic fix. Why are they putting an electronic fix in if it's the floor mat or if it's the pedal? Uh, they say it's for customer uh, um, good, uh, you know, so they'll feel safe. Um, I think it's because it's a software problem. And uh, if the vehicles have been fixed with the floor mat and the pedal and they still run away, then there's obviously another problem. And uh, I think there are also vehicles that are uh, not covered by the recall that may have these problems. They may not be identical. They may use a different software, so they're not identical problem. But there's no question in my mind that this is an electronic issue. And uh, I think the company took the position early on that it wasn't because that hurts their sales with consumers. Consumers don't like software glitches they can't understand. And they couldn't change. Now, if they change their mind, they're going to be subject to 18 U.S.C. 1001 lying to the government and going to jail. So they're in a very difficult position. Why would they do that now if that they've taken this position in the hardcore way that they have? And uh, I was at a Senate hearing the other day, and there were 21 people representing Toyota sitting in front of me. And I said to them, gee, you have a lot of lobbyists here. And they said, oh, no, 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 these are all communications people. I think that they're looking at this as a communications fix as opposed to a real fix of this vehicle. I want to thank all the witnesses for your impressive testimony and look forward to working with all of you as we move forward on these important issues. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The Chair uh, thanks the gentleman. <clears throat> and the Chair also thanks uh, himself, thanks all the witnesses for, again, for your patience and for your time that you have uh, contributed to us. Your testimony has been invaluable uh, as we proceed um, down this path for reauthorizing NHTSA. Uh, and the chair thanks you and um, know, I want you to know that the American people uh, really, you've done a great service to the American people, the driving public today. Thank you very much. Uh, the subcommittee is, stands adjourned. Next on C-SPAN, Vice President Biden talks about the Middle East peace process in a speech in Tel Aviv.